For as long as I can remember, I've felt most at home among the ancient redwoods and lush ferns of Northern California's forests. I grew up in Eureka, a small logging town on the edge of the Redwood National Park. My dad worked for the National Park Service and would often take me hiking and camping in the park. I loved breathing in the scent of earth and moss, listening to birds calling overhead and watching deer graze in meadow clearings. As a kid, I devoured books about wilderness adventures and dreamed of one day protecting these lands myself. After college, I was thrilled to get a job as a park ranger at Redwood National Park. At age 25, I became one of the youngest rangers to cover one of the park's remote districts. My district spans about 20,000 acres of dense forest and windswept coastline along the Northern California coast. In the last few years, I've gotten to know this landscape intimately, every hidden creek and giant spruce. It still takes my breath away each time I crest a hill and see sunlight streaming between the massive redwood trunks, some over 350 feet tall. These forests contain some of the tallest, oldest trees on earth. I feel honored to be their caretaker. Part of my job involves patrolling the backcountry trails to check for fallen trees, maintain campsites, and make sure hikers are safe. Hikers have to be savvy and self-sufficient to take on these remote routes. Cell service is non-existent, and help could be hours away if something goes wrong. But the beauty and serenity of the backcountry is unparalleled. It was a crisp autumn morning as I set out on my patrol of the Northwest Trails, the sun still low in the sky casting long shadows between the mighty redwoods. I savored the quiet serenity that comes with being one of the few souls far from civilization in this ancient forest. As a park ranger for this district, solitude and connection with nature are parts of the job I relish. I began my hike at the Panther Creek Trailhead, breathing deep the scent of fir needles and fern fronds glistening with dew. But as I walked, I noticed something amiss in the stillness. The usual bustle of birds flitting from branch to branch was absent. I paused, listening for their songs, but heard nothing except the soft rustle of wind through the trees. Up ahead, I spotted a Douglas squirrel perched on a fallen nurse log, staring intently at something unseen. Squirrels around these parts are boisterous creatures, known for their spirited territorial chases. But this one sat frozen in place, tail twitching, before scurrying into a hollow log without making a sound. A chill went through me despite the mild weather. Something had the wildlife on edge here. Farther down the trail, I came across several small birds' nests, abandoned midway through construction. Delicate pieces of moss and twig littered the ground below the crooks of maple boughs, their nest builders nowhere to be seen. It was as if they had left in a hurry, a strange occurrence so late in the season. My sense of foreboding grew. I quickened my pace towards the meadows that open up along the creek, hoping to find the herds of Roosevelt elk that make this area their summer home. When I reached the edge of the meadow, I stopped short. Rather than the expected tranquil scene of grazing elk, the grassy expanse was empty and silent, showing no signs of the large creatures. I scanned the tree line, squinting for any movement in the shadows. Had the herds headed lower in elevation already to escape the autumn chill? It seemed far too early for their seasonal migration. Just then, a crack of a branch at the meadow's edge made me wheel around. A small herd of deer burst from the tree cover, bounding through the golden grass with white tails raised. Even at this distance, I could see the wild look in their eyes and the power in their muscular leaps as they fled in instinctual panic. Before I could ponder the strange sight further, the deer disappeared into the forest as quickly as they had appeared. I scratched my head in bewilderment. Something had driven them from their sheltered grazing spot in terror. But what? No predator I knew of hunted deer here, especially not in broad daylight. And I had never seen such frantic behavior from these normally calm creatures. I strained to listen for any sound that seemed out of place, but was met only with silence. The stillness felt heavy now, as if the forest was holding its breath. I checked my watch, still hours until sundown. 
Rather than head back, I needed to learn more while there was light left. I turned and continued pushing farther into the remote northwest reaches. The trail wound parallel to Panther Creek, which tumbled over mossy boulders carrying meltwater from the high country. I paused to fill my canteen, eyes roving the opposite shore. There, imprinted in the mud, several massive clawed footprints that made the hair on my neck stand up. No black bear or cougar left tracks even close to that size. The stride was bipedal, with a swiftness unlike any animal native to these parts. I scrambled to photograph the prints, hoping the detail wouldn't be lost when the creek rose. This was solid evidence something strange was afoot. The prints led downstream before disappearing at the water's edge. I tracked their direction as best I could from the bank, weaving between crumbling spruce trunks. But after a hundred yards or so, the trail went cold at a rocky section of creek. Whoever, or whatever, made the tracks had traveled on without leaving another trace. The sun was sinking towards the ridgeline now, casting the forest in deepening shadow. I knew I needed to make camp soon rather than hike all the way back to the trailhead in darkness. Something odd was happening here, and I had to find out what. I found a flat spot to pitch my tent just off the trail and gathered deadwood to start a fire, keeping busy to ignore my creeping sense of unease. Whatever I had heard last night, I prayed this night would pass uneventfully. But the memory of those massive prints lingered, and I kept my hunting knife close. Night fell, the clouds cleared, and a million stars shone bright through the canopy above. The fire crackled, keeping the darkness at bay. But sleep evaded me. I kept thinking of the deer's terrified flight, and the abandoned nests, and those strange, inexplicable prints. Nothing about this area's natural ecosystem could explain it away. Around midnight I jolted upright. This time, the crack of a branch didn't come from my own movements gathering more wood for the fire. Something was out there, circling in the darkness just beyond the reach of the firelight. I strained my eyes but could see nothing besides the black shapes of brush and tree trunks. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched from the shadows. Gripping my knife tightly, I called out, Who's there? Identify yourself! The only reply was heavy footsteps circling to the other side of my campsite. They sounded like they came from something massive, far larger than any hiker. Adrenaline shot through me as I realized whatever was out there, I did not want it to know I was alone and vulnerable. I picked up a flaming branch from the fire and thrust it overhead, yelling, I'm armed! Come out or I'll shoot! A bluff that hopefully sounded convincing. The footsteps stopped. For several agonizing minutes, I stood frozen. Then, from somewhere deep in the trees, a bone-chilling howl rose that seemed to echo all around me. The hairs on my neck stood at attention. Wolves? Here? Impossible. But no wolf ever made a howl like that. Before I could make sense of it, the heavy, circling footsteps resumed their rhythmic pacing just out of view. But they seemed more distant now, as if my bluff had worked. I kept the fire stoked and my knife ready until sunrise finally melted the darkness away. Once there was enough light, I ventured out to search for tracks again, but found nothing conclusive nearby. Whatever had been lurking beyond the firelight had left no traces behind. But now there was no denying something, some creature, was out there roaming these woods, and I wouldn't rest until I found out what. The next morning, I awoke well before sunrise, feeling completely unrested after the long and uneasy night. The strange noises of heavy footsteps circling my campsite and distant, chilling howls still haunted me. I got up quickly, ate some trail mix for breakfast, and began breaking down my tent by the pale light of early dawn. I was eager to search the entire area in the calm morning hours for any clues as to what had prowled so close outside my tent after dark. Once I had my gear packed up and the campsite restored to leave no trace, I began walking slowly along the perimeter, scanning the ground and vegetation for any signs of disturbance. At first, in the dim light, I saw nothing anomalous, 
just pine needles and forest debris scattered about. But as the rising sun gradually illuminated the woods around me, I started noticing several areas where the ferns and brush appeared smashed down and damaged by something large passing through. The deer trails that crisscrossed the forest here were easy to identify, smaller and with clean indentations of cloven hooves wherever they crossed bare earth. These other tracks were anomalies, breaking through the vegetation with force. I followed one area of crushed ferns and broken branches that seemed to circle the campsite at a distance, keeping within the tree line. At several points, I could make out individual massive footprints, far larger than any black bear or cougar left. They had a strange, almost canine shape, with four long, prominent claws. The size and depth of the prints indicated something weighing several hundred pounds or more had made them. Uneasy, I took photos as best I could in the low morning light. These prints were concrete proof that those heavy footsteps stalking around my tent last night were not just my imagination or some small animal. Something very large and bipedal had circled me under cover of darkness. And it was clearly not just curious, but intelligent. I discovered another trail of the giant prints heading downstream, and I followed them along the creek bed where the sandy soil took even clearer impressions. Whatever had made them had been walking upright on two legs, and from the length of its stride it must have stood at least eight feet tall. That ruled out any normal animal native to these forests. The prints appeared almost canine, yet shaped more like a human foot than a paw. As the trail led over a log, I could make out claw marks digging deep into the bark where it had gripped for balance. When I placed my own hand over one of the claw marks, my fingers barely covered half the length. A few hundred yards downstream, the prints simply disappeared into the rocky creek bed without even a smudge of sandy soil beyond that point. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. I backtracked, scouring the banks for any trail heading into the forest, but found no traces leading out of the creek. Mystified and increasingly unnerved, I watched the swiftly brightening forest around me. What could be lurking just out of sight, watching me from the shadows? For the first time in my career as a ranger, I felt unsafe under the tranquil trees I knew so well. Something ancient and deadly stalked these silent woods, and I had to figure out what it was before it turned its unseen sights on other hikers, or myself. I kept searching as the morning mist burned away, hoping to find some fur clumps from whatever had prowled outside my tent that night. But other than the bizarre footprints, the forest had no secrets to reveal. I did notice the woods were eerily silent as I tracked, no birds singing, no squirrels chattering. Only the wind through the trees made any sound. It seemed even the wildlife was laying low this morning, sensing a predator was near. It was late afternoon by the time I had finished going over every inch of the area around my remote campsite from the previous night. I had found plenty of evidence of something massive and bipedal lurking just outside my tent after dark. But no further clues revealed themselves as to what exactly the identity of my nocturnal stalker had been. Uneasy, I decided to hike farther down the trail along Panther Creek before heading back, hoping the last warm sunlight filtering through the towering firs might illuminate something I had missed. I walked slowly, eyes scanning the forest floor for any signs of disturbance. The only sounds were the rushing water of the creek beside me and my own footsteps crunching on gravel and pine needles. The silence in the hushed cathedral of the great trees felt heavy and ominous. Normally birds and squirrels made these woods feel alive, but since last night's encounter, even the wildlife seemed to be laying low. Their absence left me jumpy, senses straining for any tiny movement or noise out of place. I was so focused on the trees around me that I almost didn't notice the elderly Native American man standing silently beside the trail until I was nearly alongside of him. I started violently, one hand going reflexively to the bear spray on my belt. The man regarded me with an impassive expression. His sudden presence here miles from any trailhead or road surprised me. He wore simple garments of deer hide and woven wool, his long silver hair bound in braids. Age creased his features, but his dark eyes were alert, watching me intently. 
recovering myself, I gave a respectful nod. Sorry for the intrusion, sir. Are you lost out here? Can I help you find your way? The man shook his head slowly. One cannot be lost walking in the heart of the mother's land. I am Grey Wolf. I live here. His voice was steady and rich with the traces of a coastal indigenous accent. I introduced myself as a park ranger, curious how this man had come to live alone so deep in the backcountry. As if reading my thoughts, he remarked, For many years, your kind has not ventured into this part of the forest. Tell me, what brings you here now? Uneasy memories of the prior night flooded back at his question. I found myself telling Grey Wolf the whole strange tale, the circling footsteps, the chilling howls from no animal I recognized, the giant mysterious prints around my camp. His eyes narrowed as I described my encounter. When I finished, he stared into the woods for a long moment before speaking. The beast you describe walks these lands again after a long sleep. It has awakened with hunger once more. I asked eagerly what he meant, wondering if he had seen signs of the creature himself. Grey Wolf gestures me to sit beside him on a fallen log. He began telling a legend passed down through generations of his tribe, one rarely shared outside their people. There is a being in these ancient forests that dwells in the hidden places between shadows and light. Every hundred summers, it awakens to feed for a season before returning to its slumber. When awake, it is a terror, a giant, hairy creature that walks on two legs, claws like obsidian knives, eyes that burn like blood in the darkness. It takes the form of man, wolf, bear, bird, whatever shape aids its hunt. We know it as the Stayway. Your people would call it a monster. I listened in dismay as Grey Wolf described the Stayway's insatiable hunger, driving it to hunt relentlessly during its waking periods. It nearly wiped out my tribe over a century ago when I was but a boy. Back then it moved through villages in the night like a ghost, leaving only blood and bones where it passed. His eyes held a deep sadness. Many of our warriors hunted it for moons to stop its carnage, but their arrows and spears glanced off the stayway's hide like pebbles. Only our shaman was able to wound it, wielding an enchanted dagger passed down through generations, but much knowledge from those times has been lost. He shook his head sadly. I sat dumbfounded, struggling to believe his tale, yet knowing what I had heard and seen matched it too closely to dismiss. Finally I asked, How can the Stewie be stopped for good? There must be some way we can kill it. Grey Wolf met my gaze with his mournful black eyes. You speak from courage. But this beast is not of the natural world. It knows no death, only long periods of slumber. However, it is said to be weak to silver and most vulnerable during the full moon when its powers are greatest. If wounded then by an elder weapon, it may perish for generations. He fixed me with an intense look. The signs show its season of hunting has begun anew in these valleys. You must be wary and prepared. I sat in silence for a long moment after Grey Wolf finished speaking, processing his disturbing words. The creature's existence seemed impossible, out of myth. Yet its description aligned too closely with what I had encountered. This was no ordinary animal roaming the darkness. This was something ancient, hungry, and cunning. And I knew I could not simply stand by while it hunted these lands again. When I departed down the trail, Grey Wolf's warnings lingered uneasily in my mind. The shadows seemed to watch me now as I hiked. I sensed this stairway observing me even now, though I could not see it. After my encounter with Grey Wolf, I struggled deeply to accept that some immortal mythic beast could actually be real and walking the earth. The pragmatic naturalist in me rebelled against the very concept of such a creature existing outside of folk tales and legends. Yet the more I turned over the brief but disturbing glimpses I had gotten on those chilling nights in the woods, the more the being Grey Wolf described aligned with what I had heard and seen. 
As much as I wanted to dismiss his ancestral stories as vivid imagination or cultural mythology, I knew I could not simply ignore them, regardless of how fantastical and impossible they seemed. If Grey Wolf was right, then something far beyond my experience lurked in the shadows, under the moonlight of those northern forests. And it would surely kill again without mercy, if not stopped. I wrestled with the implications for days, questioning my own sanity at times. Had isolation and stress caused me to read too much into odd but explainable events? But when I closed my eyes, I heard again the bone-chilling howls echoing around my tent that night. Saw again the massive, bizarrely shaped prints along the creek bank. My deepest intuition screamed that what I had encountered defied logical explanation. And if this was some primordial predator, it posed a grave threat I could not ignore. Over the next few days, I put aside my regular ranger duties, instead pouring all my energy into digging up anything I could related to the legend Grey Wolf had recounted. But details remained frustratingly sparse as I scoured anthropology databases, indigenous oral histories, and cryptozoology archives for clues. Most of the native tribes in this region had preserved their history and folklore orally through storytelling rather than written records. Finding substantiating evidence through literature alone seemed near impossible. Refusing to give up, I expanded my search for documented accounts of unknown predators across the entire Pacific Northwest, looking for any common threads in eyewitness stories that might hint at a real creature. There were a scattering of tales going back decades, campers reporting confrontations with giant bipedal beasts with glowing eyes, experienced hikers vanishing without a trace near cave networks, seasoned loggers finding animal carcasses torn apart and utterly hollowed in deeply disturbing ways that no ordinary predator could accomplish. But nothing concrete definitively tied all these chilling accounts together beyond a pervading sense of the supernatural and paranormal lurking behind it all. On a whim, I broadened the scope to similar accounts across North America. Again, I found scattered stories of unnaturally large, intelligent predator creatures and grisly massacres blamed on mythical beasts. But infuriatingly, nothing constituted a critical mass of evidence pointing to one specific species. Most were isolated cases, surrounded by uncertainty. Still, a creeping unease settled upon me as I noted the geographic range of eerily analogous accounts spanning the continent. This seemed to hint at a real, physical creature, but known to many indigenous groups under different names. Late one night reading by flashlight in my cabin, I came across a single faded account in a 19th century explorer's diary that sent a chill down my spine. The natives believe this barren land is stalked by a great devil that wears the form of man and wolf by turns. It knows no hunger nor pity, only an insatiable taste for blood. In its gaze, your limbs turn to ice, though its hide cannot be pierced by arrow or musket ball. At night we often hear fearsome howls echo across the rocks that do not belong to any earthly animal. The tone of the diary entry, aligned with Grey Wolf's warnings about the merciless creature, making the mythic being described feel unsettlingly real. I could no longer deny that something was out there roaming the ancient forests, had been out there stalking unsuspecting prey for untold generations since the land itself was young. It had worn countless names over eras, but perhaps Grey Wolf's people had come closest to identifying its true monstrous nature. And now the Stewe, as he called it, had awoken again from some infernal slumber. I realized I would need to take matters into my own hands and gather tangible evidence of its existence directly out in the creature's own territory. My mind turned to acquiring motion-activated cameras designed for monitoring wildlife activity patterns, modified with enhanced night vision capabilities, and extended battery life. I reasoned that if this being was primarily nocturnal as Lore suggested, I might be able to finally capture it on film under the cover of darkness. Definitive photographic proof could convince even the most skeptical forest managers that this was no mere legend or folk tale haunting these woods. It took nearly a week of phone calls and strings pulled with favors, 
but I managed to specially order half a dozen state-of-the-art digital wildlife cameras equipped with infrared sensors and flash optimized for night shooting. The cameras could run over two weeks on one set of batteries and would automatically snap dozens of images when triggered by a passing animal's movement and body heat signature. If positioned wisely, they stood a real chance of capturing this cunning creature on its nightly prowl, provided it was flesh and blood. Once the special cameras finally arrived, I carefully set them up at strategic locations throughout a 20-mile radius in the dense northern backcountry I had designated the beast's most probable domain. I concentrated my focus on placing the cameras overlooking secluded valleys, shadowy cave mouths, and heavily trafficked game trails, steering clear of the public hiking paths. Anywhere I deemed a likely haunt or hunting ground for a powerful nocturnal predator, I concealed a camera among the rocks and trees to point directly at the area. After positioning and carefully camouflaging the last of the six cameras, I could only hope and wait now that my instincts were correct about this general area of forest being the creature's primary territory. I had done everything in my power to maximize the chances of capturing it on film. Now began the agonizing waiting game, returning each day to check the camera's memory cards and wondering if today would finally be the day I obtained definitive footage of this legendary beast prowling the night unfettered. The first week slowly crawled by with no results as I hiked mile after mile to collect the memory cards, eager to review each one. My hopes sank lower each time I plugged in a card, only to find unbroken sequences of mundane wildlife. Foraging deer, scampering raccoons, roosting birds. No images betrayed anything larger, stranger, or more ominous roaming the dark forest. But I forced myself to remain patient and keep monitoring. One grainy photo would be all I needed to radically shift the tone of this cryptic investigation. Nearly two full weeks passed without anything significant captured on the camera's nightly vigils. Self-doubt began creeping into my mind that I had miscalculated. Perhaps the creature had already slipped away to some far corner of the vast mountain forests, miles from where I had focused my efforts. Or perhaps it was not truly nocturnal, and instead lay dormant in some hidden underground burrow or cave network in the daytime that I would never manage to uncover on my own. Meanwhile, the moon progressed ever closer towards fullness. Then, finally, after sixteen tense days, when I retrieved the memory card from one of the most remote cameras positioned atop a sheer walled gorge, my breath caught sharply. For there on the night vision enhanced footage was clearly a large bipedal creature covered in shaggy fur slowly walking along the gorge rim. It paused, seeming to stare directly at the camera, eyes reflecting the infrared flash eerily. The image was blurred by distance and foliage, but there could be no mistaking the sheer massive scale of the thing towering among the trees. After endless fruitless waiting and doubts, at last, I had concrete proof. The ancient creature of Lore Grey Wolf had warned me about did indeed prowl the darkest reaches of this park by night. And it was on the hunt. With this first photographic evidence of the creature's existence, I immediately set out to find Grey Wolf again. I felt compelled to show him proof that this was no myth, but a living entity stalking the night's shadows just as he had warned. Tracking Grey Wolf's wandering encampment down took inquiry with numerous contacts among the local indigenous community elders. But finally, I received guidance to seek him in the traditional winter hunting grounds along the Western Valley Network, bisecting the high country. After an exhaustive trek, I located Grey Wolf's modest camp just as the sun was setting scarlet over the snow-dusted ridgeline. The smell of wood smoke guided me to a cave shelter decorated with animal hide draperies and age-worn native symbols carved into the stone walls. Grey Wolf sat crouched by a small fire, cooking the game birds strung out on a line nearby. He nodded in stoic recognition as I approached and took a seat on a log bench across the flames. The dancing firelight reflected in his penetrating dark eyes as he studied me. The forest whispers you have returned to her wild reaches. Did you find what you sought? He inquired. 
I nodded eagerly and pulled out my smartphone, fingers trembling slightly in my haste. When I had related the full story of deploying the remote cameras, Grey Wolf listened intently without a hint of surprise, as if merely hearing confirmation of what he already knew to be true. Finally, I opened the photo gallery app and accessed the pivotal image. In the firelight, the pixelated figure of the hulking creature taken unaware was blurred but unmistakable. Grey Wolf's expression turned grave as he studied the screen. Now you have seen it with your own eyes. The beast walks once more under night's cloak, its ancient hunger never sated, he said. I felt a ripple of unease remembering his previous warnings that the creature would be dangerously formidable when its time came around again. What more can you share about stopping this thing before the full moon? I asked. Surely your ancestors must have passed down some knowledge to defeat it for good. Grey Wolf's eyes took on a distant, sorrowful look as he gazed into the crackling flames. Ours was a costly victory, paid in many lives. But yes, secrets were found that allowed our greatest warriors working together to finally pierce its dark heart using weapons forged by our elders. We must remake them. He rose swiftly, moving to the back of the cave shelter. I turned to see him withdraw a leather bundle from a concealed hollow in the rocks. Returning to the fireside, he unrolled it carefully to reveal an ornate, aged dagger with a carved ivory handle marked by symbols. My skin prickled looking upon the ancient blade that had once tasted the cursed creature's blood, according to legend. This pierced its vile heart long ago, Grey Wolf said. Now it calls out again for the battle ahead. He rotated the mysterious dagger slowly, its polished obsidian edge glinting in the firelight. Keep it close in the coming days. With it and the spirits of my ancestors beside us, we may prevail again. His eyes bore into mine, flickering with the reflected flames. I gripped the dagger's handle tightly, feeling the heft of the generations entrusted to me in this moment. Here is Act 4 in a 3,000-word first-person narrative, including Jim's internal thoughts. I could waste no more time. The full moon was less than 48 hours away now, when according to legend, the beast would be at the height of its power. I had to take it down before its darkness was unleashed on the land. I spent the next day in preparation, gathering equipment and weapons for a trek into the backcountry in pursuit of the creature. I packed ample camping gear, provisions, first aid supplies, and my most powerful bear-deterring spray. Although I held little hope such earthly weapons would work on this supernatural evil, they brought some comfort. My main protection would be the enchanted ivory-handled dagger passed down through generations of Grey Wolf's people. I sheathed it carefully at my belt. As the day's light faded, I suited up in camo apparel and hiking boots for the rugged terrain ahead. I slipped night vision goggles into my pack, along with climbing ropes and gear. The creature surely made its lair somewhere hidden and remote. I readied my nerves for the confrontation to come. I reached the valley networks as dusk settled between the silent trees. According to the cameras, this was the general area the creature had been spotted, yet within lay miles of dense forests and sheer cliff faces. Finding its lair could take days unless I caught a lucky break. As night swallowed the woods, I crept forward relying on moonlight and my night vision optics. The trees themselves seemed to watch my progress swaying ominously through no wind blew. I followed game trails when I could, looking for abnormal tracks or territorial markings. At times I felt unseen eyes tracking me, yet my goggles revealed nothing but still shadows. After hours of fruitless searching, I finally paused to rest. Suddenly, a bone-chilling howl pierced the air that seemed to come from every direction at once. It was no wolf or coyote. This was the creature. I was close now. Gripping the ivory dagger tightly, I pressed on with renewed energy. Rounding an escarpment studded with towering cedars, 
I drew a sharp breath. There, deep into several tree trunks, were massive claw marks gouging ten feet up the bark. They looked freshly torn, the sap still oozing from the wounds. I traced my fingers over one gigantic slash, my entire hand dwarfed by the size. Nearby, more trees displayed similar gashes like territorial signposts. There was no doubt in my mind now. This was the lair of the beast. I crept forward, senses hyper-alert for any sound or shifting shadows. The chilling howls continued sporadically, seeming to come from somewhere just ahead past a narrow ravine. Gripping my night vision goggles, I slowly approached the gorge's edge, peering down. There, my blood turned to ice. For below lay a cavern opening into the cliff face, strewn with gnawed bones. Inside, a pair of glowing eyes flashed briefly in the darkness, yellow, feral, and utterly inhuman. This was it, the creature's den. I quickly rigged my ropes and rappelled silently down the rocky gorge wall, landing lightly on the ledge by the cavern's mouth. The eyes flashed again from the blackness within, accompanied by a rumbling growl. The beast knew I was here. Stealing my courage, I crept into its lair, dagger poised. I would face this monster on its own ground. As I crossed the threshold, the beast erupted from the shadows with a deafening roar. I had no time to react before it struck me with the force of a freight train, sending me flying against the cavern wall. Dazed, I looked up at the towering creature looming over me. It was even more horrific than I imagined. Eight feet of matted fur and muscle on two legs, razor claws, and jagged fangs gleaming. Its stench choked me along with its palpable aura of ancient evil. Those glowing eyes bored into me, full of predatory hunger and cunning. It knew what I had come for. When it lunged again, I was ready. I dove and slashed with the ivory dagger, drawing a streak of inky blood from its forearm. The beast shrieked in fury and swiped at me, claws gouging the rock where I had stood a heartbeat before. We circled each other, its every movement shockingly fast for such bulk. I landed a few glancing slashes, but the creature seemed only enraged, not weakened. As it pinned me against the cavern wall, I knew then Grey Wolf's warnings were true. No earthly weapon could kill this creature. In desperation, I stabbed at its chest, aiming for the heart. But like its arm, the wound only oozed darkness a moment before sealing over again, the dagger's magic repelled by the beast's cursed hide. With terrible clarity, I realized there would be no defeating this immortal evil. As the creature reared back to finish me, ancient intelligence flickering in its fiery gaze, I grieved that I had failed the forest and Grey Wolf's ancestors. The reawakened beast would only be emboldened by my resistance, and would now surely rage unchecked under the rising full moon, taking lives until sated. With my final strength, I slashed the rope anchoring me, abseiling blindly down the gorge wall as the monstrous thing swiped futilely above. It unleashed an ear-splitting shriek of fury at my escape, no doubt vowing I would not evade its grasp again. Half climbing, half tumbling in reckless flight, I reached the gorge floor. There I collapsed, bloodied and exhausted. Only the creature's inability to quickly scale the sheer cliffs had allowed my escape. But we both knew the beast had truly won this night, and tomorrow's full moon would see a horror unleashed upon the land that I was powerless to stop. Eventually, I got up and followed the cave back to the surface. Bruised and bloodied, I stumbled through the moonlit forest, consumed with bitter failure. My encounter with the beast at its lair had left me shattered, both physically and in spirit. The creature had shrugged off my every attack as though I were no more than an insect. Grey Wolf's enchanted dagger had been useless against its cursed immortal flesh, just as the legends foretold. I had been arrogant to think I could stop something so ancient and evil which had decimated trained warriors before. Now wounded prey would litter these valleys by dawn, and the blood moon had not yet reached its peak. Anguish tore through me at the thought of the innocent lives that would be brutally ended, 
and the pain Grey Wolf would feel that his ancestor's victory over the beast meant nothing now. This primordial force of malice arose again, never to rest until it had gorged itself on flesh and fear. All hope seemed lost. As I limped aimlessly through the woods, the trees themselves seeming to twist and contort in my tear-blurred vision, a familiar commanding voice called out from the shadows ahead. You are marked but not yet beaten, Ranger. Grey Wolf emerged from between two massive cedars, his eyes radiating emotional energy. We must go swiftly if this evil is finally to meet its end tonight. I shook my head bitterly. Your enchanted dagger failed. No earthly weapon can stop this thing. Grey Wolf grasped my shoulder firmly with surprising strength. You weakened it, and dawn draws near when it will be at its most vulnerable. We must return to its lair before the creeping sun. Hope flickered tentatively inside me again at his words. If daylight could hinder the creature as legend said, perhaps there was a slim chance left. We had to try while it rested, recovering from our earlier battle. I straightened with gritted teeth. The beast would not expect me to return emboldened. Perhaps together with Grey Wolf, we could still somehow end this curse. We arrived at the cliffside gorge concealing the creature's cave just as the blackness of night began to dilute towards Grey. The forest was hushed, as if holding its breath. I prayed we were not too late as we descended silently into the ravine using Grey Wolf's climbing vines. The cavern stood gaping and dark before us. A guttural snarl rumbled from the shadows as our eyes adjusted. The beast was waiting, crouched low amidst the gnawed bones of past victims. Dried blood crusted its fur and claws from our earlier battle, and I saw that the wounds I had dealt it remained open and raw. It had not fully healed as I feared. Perhaps its powers did wane with the approaching dawn. It watched our advance with blazing eyes, waiting to see if we would flee or attack. Grey Wolf began murmuring an eerie chant beside me, and the ivory dagger thrummed with energy in response. The beast tensed, hatred etched on its grotesque face. Together, Grey Wolf and I leaped forward with weapons drawn, hoping to overwhelm the monster weakened in daylight. It met us with savage fury, slashing and punching with impossible speed, but I could see it fading compared to the night before. When it reared up to strike me, Grey Wolf drove his spear deep into its thigh while it was off balance. The point, carved of the meteorite by his tribe, sizzled in the creature's rancid flesh. It howled in agony, rounding on Grey Wolf, but I seized the chance and drove the ivory blade up under its ribcage. Black ichor poured from the fatal wound, its light dimming at last. The beast's howl turned to a gurgling shriek as it thrashed violently but the blessed dagger held firm, pinning its heart. With a final guttural cry that echoed through the ravine, the hulking body collapsed, shaking the ground. Silence fell over the forest. When we emerged bloodied but victorious from the cave into the gold light of dawn, a stillness hung over the valleys, the tranquility of a dark power having finally passed. In the weeks after, the forest slowly came back to life. Birds returned to sing in branches once again. Deer grazed calm where they had once fled in terror. The nights no longer held a sinister chill. My wounds have long since healed, leaving just pale scars as reminders of my role in ending the ancient curse. Grey Wolf says the beast's spirit remains bound for many lifetimes, its power is broken. But he and those after him will keep vigil, for evil ever seeks a way back into the light.